today, the Lord gave me a word, and, you know, I don't go real long here, so we had a lot of ministry here, so we'll get out early enough, but the Lord gave me a word about his shalom. He's the, the God of peace, and, and you know, especially in, in what we're all going through now in the crazy world that we're in, how many of you know we need some peace, huh? And that he is our prince of peace. And he's the one that, you know, it's, it's something that he gives us in the inside. It's not a, it's not a situation that causes peace. It, he is the prince of peace. And so we're going we're gonna to cover that today. And I forgot my card. Um, Christine Bells is a friend of ours. And she has a ministry. It's called the Chalkboard, Chalkboard Ministry where she, she teaches on the Hebraic months. And she does a fabulous job. And she, she uh, created these posts where it's uh, just postcards of each month, and then she just gives you highlights of what each month he rightly uh, represents. And, and so um, it, it keeps us on track, and that's what the Holy Spirit wants us, always to, to, to look to see what we can do for ourselves in getting closer to him, right? So this is the Hebraic month of she Shezvan. See, I, I, I would have had my props with me, and I forgot it. It's, uh, we're in the year 5782. It's C-H-E-S-H-V-A-N, which represents new beginnings. How many of you want some new beginnings? Okay, we are, you know, we're, we're in, uh, you know, we were in pause for a long time. Now there's a reset button that's been pushed. And so, you know, I say, yay, Lord, let's, let me see what I can change for this new beginnings. It doesn't just happen, right? We have to make some changes. Like we saw today, people coming up. We have to give up our right to be right. Because how many of you know that sometimes we act like we know more than Jesus, but it doesn't work, right? So when, when you see that you're going around that mountain over and over again, maybe you need to just surrender to the Lord, because that's what I had to do. You know, Italians, you know, my husband always talks about him, his family being Sicilian or the Sicilians, and they have hard heads. So after a while... <laughs> After a while, after a while, you have to keep hitting and hitting and hitting and breaking things down. But you see, that's for all of us. I'm just kidding. I mean, we all have hard heads somewhat, right? <laughs> anyway, um, you know, or, or I'll forget it. But anyway, so <laughs> let me just go with the message. So it's also, this month represents repentance, but we know that every month, is a time of repentance, right? And to always go before the Lord and, and to ask him, yield our hearts to him, where we get angry or we can get bitter or resentment uh, in our hearts. And <clears throat> the tribe uh, represented here is Manasseh, and it means he made me to forget. And that's what the Holy Spirit's doing in this season, healing our hearts, causing us to surrender, causing us to ask him for new beginnings, causing us to, or asking us, or to choose to forgive to release the resentment, to release the bitterness, the strife, the contention, which we'll talk a little bit about. The other thing is we have to war over situations, and you'll see in the message today, with our words. What are we speaking? Are we speaking life? Because the Bible says life and death are in the power of our tongue. Listen, I know that there are people here, there's people online, you're disappointed, you're upset with what's happening. Forget, what, you know, with our nation and what's going on, it's, it's, it's crazy. And, and our nation needs our prayers, doesn't need our complaints. And so we need to call those things which be not as though they are. But even in our families, even in our situations, in our job situations, what good is it rehearsing all the time of the bad things that's happening? Let's speak the word. Let's prophesy. And you'll see according to the word here today that I'm going to speak that that's what God is requiring us to do or he's asking us to do. The other thing about this month that, that she had on her card is about stepping on scorpion, uh, scorpions and serpents, which we did. Our worship time, our, de our declaration time, our prayer time, that's, that's stomping on his head. And for those of you who don't like to worship, I'll, I'll just speak to people online here. For those of you that don't like to worship, there is a reason. Because we, we, we destroy the enemy, but it's also we want to honor God. So if there's a problem there that of worship, I'm just saying this because I care about you. There's intimacy issues. Ask the Lord to help you with that. You know, I mean, I, I remember the first time I ever went to a church where I saw them raise their hand. I thought, are these people crazy? I am not raising my hand. I was so turned off and intimidated by it. 
until I started studying the word. And then I saw the, the power of what happens when you enter into worship, how it brings deliverance and freedom into our lives. So ask Holy Spirit to help you. You know, he loves us so much that he doesn't want us to stay where we're at. So he's going to keep prodding us and prodding us. It's not that people want to be a pain. It's just that we, we, we know the, the deliverance that it brings in the healing, right? So what I wrote here, uh, I said, peace. How do we find peace in the, much, in the midst of what's happening? How do you find peace? I mean, peace, I, I think it was John Paul Jackson who said it, that peace is the potting soil of revelation. I need revelation. I need the wisdom of the Lord. But when you're in fear and anxiety and turmoil, you are not getting that revelation, that download that you need for strategy from the Lord. So, you know, we have to, Chuck Pierce, when he was here, he said, we have to ride the roots. Basically, we're uncovering root systems, and that's what we're going to address today, the root systems of anxiety and fear that really hinders our peace in Jesus, all right? So, um, Franklin Roosevelt said this, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And then somebody else said this, and I don't know who said it, said, fear has a mysterious attraction, that is, it can attract or draw the very thing you're afraid of. So we have to reclaim our peace, and, and as we all know, peace is something that we cannot buy. And so what we want here is really pressing into the word, and when I get out of peace, when I get into fear and anxiety, we all do it. I mean, none of us are exempt from that. I have to center myself, get back into that place, all right, what am I listening to? What am I believing? Lord, and then I'll, I'll get in the word, I'll worship, and then it's, he does what he does so beautifully. He shifts our hearts. Sometimes it takes a little while, but most often it's, it's just like a suddenly happens and it shifts. That's why it's so important. And that's why the enemy always tries to distract us because he doesn't want us to be in that intimate place because he knows the power in it. So Matthew 6.34 in the Passion, I think you all have, uh, do they have my notes? Oh. Hmm. Okay. So I did give it to my husband in advance. Okay, so Matthew 6.34 in the Passion says, Refuse to worry about tomorrow, but deal with each challenge that comes your way one day at a time. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Isn't that good? I love the way that's worded. Refuse. That's a choice we have. I refuse to get in that place of worry and anxiety. I refuse it. When that arrow is shot at me, it's like I intercept it with, Oh, no, Lord, your word says that you've not given me a spirit of fear you know, or, you know, uh, uh, but of love, power, and sound mind. You've not called me to worry. It says, be not anxious for anything. You know, so you intercept it with the word. It doesn't mean you're in denial over your situation. But let me ask you, has worry ever changed any of your stuff, any of your situations? If anything, it makes it worse. The Italians say we had agita as a result of that. So in Judges chapter 6, we're going to talk about Gideon today. And um, um, Brian Simmons, uh, it's not online, but he does have, uh, if any of you like his stuff, which I do, J Brian Simmons has uh, the book of Joshua, Judges, and Ruth already uh, tran you know, translated or into the Passion, and it's so good. The crushing power of the Midianites overwhelmed Israel, forcing the Israelites to make hiding places of isolation for themselves in caves and mountain strongholds. I think we all know a little bit about isolation, right? So listen to what Midian means. Midian means strife or contending or compromise. Symbolically, Midian is an illustration of compromise with the world and strife that results. All right? So, so Gideon was going through this hard time, no, you know, no different than what we're going through. And so there's a lot of strife, there's a lot of contending, there's a lot of disagreements going on. But see, we can't act like the world, right? I don't have to agree with what I'm going to just say with the government or whatever they're saying because Jesus is my government. The government's not the one that gives me life or peace, right? Jesus Christ is. But all I know is that I'm not going to get into that place of strife and contending. That I'm not going to do because I don't want anything to take me away from my peace, all right? doesn't mean we don't address it issues either. So you'll see. So as a result of uh, their sinfulness, Israelites were in a great place of defeat. I, you listen, America has to turn its heart back to Jesus. There's been so much compromise in our country. But let's look at our own lives. 
So, you know, and here's the thing that it says in, in, in um, Judges chapter 6, it says here that the Midianites were all freaked out, right? And so in verse 3, it says, Israel had sown the Midianite. It was, they were dealing with the Midianites and the Amalekites. But what had happened was it says that they, the Midianites and the, and the Amalekites came against them with camels, attacking them with swords. They never saw anything like that. They never experienced anything like that. And again, I'm thinking to myself, well, we haven't experienced anything like this. I mean, we have to talk about this. Because what's happening in the world, we have never experienced anything like this. We, America is a free country, and that's not what's happening out there. We have never experienced anything like this, but what do we do? My focus is running to the arms of the Lord, too, in getting a strategy and a download. And again, it's not, you know, God's not calling us to oppose people. He's calling us to oppose the enemy, right? And so... So they, they were really in a bad time. And so it says that Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. The Amalekite, what does that represent? That represents a compromising attitude. And so what do we have in the world? A compromising attitude where we, we're straddling the fence. A lot of the churches, you know, the Bible says if you're hot or cold, he said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. But if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Just being complacent. Just being passive in our walk, it's okay to sin. No, it's not okay to sin because you, you, you open up the door for the enemy to bring destruction into your life. It's little at a time, little at a time, and you don't think it's going to harm you. It does. And so, you know, we can't coddle ourselves any longer. Like Adriel came up, he's like, come on, it's time. But you know what? It's time. None of us, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm teaching a class on, on, on offense on Wednesdays. You think we need it? The bait of Satan? That's what the book is called. It's called, uh, it's a scandal. It's a trap that's set up for us, and the men are doing it as well. More than ever, we have to understand we can't fall into that trap because it's so easy. We all get offended. We all get hurt. But I don't want to stay in that place of, of where it's, it's a compromise and defeat. What would Jesus do? Where is Jesus at in this? So uh, in Judges chapter 6, verses 7 through 10, in the Amplified, it says, Now it came to pass when they cried out to the Lord because of Midian that the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. I don't want to go back to bondage. I don't want to go back to a place of slavery. He says, I brought you out. But he sent a prophet. And the prophets are releasing the word of the Lord. And so what does the enemy try to do recently? Discredit the prophets. He said, I sent a prophet to the Israelites. And he said, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drive them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord, your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened and obeyed my voice. And that's why even today, you know, I said to the Lord, Lord, wherever, if you know, sometimes we have blind spots, and a lot of times we don't recognize where we're missing it. Lord, show me my heart. I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, be in this place of defeat, and it's and it's my doing at times. You know. So the Amorites uh, over here, what he's referring to, they were descendants of Canaan, and that they represent self-exaltation, where they like to dominate and rule, and they want their names uttered. I said, Lord Jesus, are you writing about our nation at this time? <laughs> Self-exaltation, what we think, rather than forget about what God thinks. How many of you saved a long time here? All right. You know, when, we, when we're talking like this, it's because of our experiential. It's because of what we experience from Jesus. You know, when, when I got saved, um, you know, I had that attitude, or as my mother from Italy would say, the attitude, and she has a attitude from here to Patterson. You know, I had the attitude, you know, the rebellious mindset. You know, don't tell me what I'm going to do. You know, I think it's okay. It's going to work for me. No, meanwhile, I was depressed. I had hopelessness and despair in my life, but don't tell me what to do. And so when people started to minister to me about the gospel, I thought, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in any of this stuff. And that's what I would tell everybody. Just, I said, I I'm an atheist. Don't bother me with this. This is crazy. And so, but I watched their lives, and people are watching your lives. 
And when I saw, I thought, you know what? This one lady, her name was Janice, she had peace. And I knew she had turmoil in her life. You know, the Bible never said we wouldn't have problems. But I saw the peace, and I thought, that's what I want. I want peace. But, of course, I wouldn't let her know that. And so uh, I thought, these people are crazy. Let me, leave me alone. <laughs> so, and then I, I cried out to Jesus one day and said, look, if you're so wonderful, and that was my holy prayer, let me see, I'll give you one year, and let me see what you can do for me. And if you can't, I'm going back to my old lifestyle. So I threatened God, but of course, he can care less what our threats are. And God met me where I was at. And you know what? There was no turning back. Did I go through some hard times? A lot of hard times, yes. But you know what? He kept bringing me into that place of freedom and deliverance and freedom and deliverance and peace and hope I, where I had hopelessness and there was despair and there was depression. God was turning it around. You think I'm going to give up on this? The woman who mentored me was an ex-madam. She was in prison for eight years. Do you think she cared about my feelings? No. And so you think she was like, oh, I don't want them to get offended. She did not care. And I'm thinking, who is is this woman talking to? Because she would say, raise your hands right now and worship Jesus. I thought, I'm not raising my hand. So, but then I thought, hey, listen, she's flowing in something that I don't have. But I mean, she was tough. We went like Elijah, I promise you. We went like Elijah. We would be offended by their gruffness. But it's time that we, we stop babying ourselves. And if I can put it this way, and I'm speaking to myself, grow up. All right, come on. We have to get out of this baby nonsense where we're constantly coddling everything. Look at this critical race theory. If you say one wrong thing, you're fired. Are you kidding me? But the people need to stand up and say enough is enough. We can't just compromise like this. She didn't care what I thought. She had a revelation of Jesus Christ that totally shifted her life around. A woman who was in prison turned her life around, and she was ministering, seeing lives transformed and changed. And that's what happened to me. So, yes, are we going to get in your face about certain things? Yeah. But you can choose to do what you want with it. It's a free country. It's supposed to be a free country, right? So what I love about this book, in, in Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 12, God was prophesying over Gideon. Now Gideon's name, when I looked it up, it means warrior. But listen to this. It says in Judges chapter 6, 11 through 12, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, and his son Gideon was beating wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, mighty man of fearless courage. And I have several different versions I have here. It, it, one of the versions says you're a champion deliverer. And so, listen, you're not supposed to thresh wheat in a wine press. You crush grapes in a wine press. You thresh, we, thresh wheat on a, th on a threshing ground out in the open. And even though he knew, God, I mean, God saw how backwards everything was. God sees how backwards things are in our life. He sees when we're afraid, when we're doing things that aren't, you know, according to the word. But he met him and he prophesied over him. He said to him, you are a mighty man. You're a champion. You're a warrior. See, we are the ones cursing ourselves half the time, even going back based upon probably what people have said over us. But, but you know, God embedded his destiny into uh, uh, Gideon as a champion deliverer by calling him Gideon. That was his name. You're a warrior. You're a warrior, and I'm not going to let, let you live in that place of fear and defeat. This is what the enemy's trying to do with all of us. Live in fear, afraid. You can't breathe on anybody. I'm not saying don't be careful. Now, you hear what I'm saying. But are you, you know, we all know our own root system. Are you living in faith or in fear? Or are you trying to, to intellectualize your feelings? What is God saying to you? Ask him. Dialogue with him about that. I get that people have health issues and this and that. Please, I'm not, I am not, uh, I'm not speaking against that. I'm just talking about, we, I know when I'm in fear. I can act like I have faith, but I know when I'm in fear. I know when I'm not in peace. I know when I have bitterness in my heart. You know, we can all play the game, put the face on, but it's coming to the place where Jesus is saying, look, we just got to be real and transparent. So God prophesied. He, he said, listen, you're a fearless warrior. And he said, now listen, God, I wrote this, God was going to do to Gideon what he was doing to, it, to the wheat. I, I don't have that up there because, uh, again, Peter didn't get send it, but that's okay. I, forget, I forgave him. I don't know where he went, but I forgave him. What? 
He's not up there. So anyway, so God was threshing. <laughs> I forgave you. I said it. <laughs> what? I went in the back and sent them the file, so hopefully they got it. See what happens when we judge and see, see? Anyway, so God was threshing his heart. And listen, he was removing the chaff of unbelief from Gideon. That's what God is doing to us right now. He's saying to you, let me remove the root system. Don't ride the root of unbelief. Let me remove the root system of unbelief in your life that's hindering you from walking in the fullness of God because we try to intellectualize everything. You're not going to understand God at times. That's just the bottom line. It's by obedience and by faith. When he told Moses to cross the Red Sea, do you think Moses got a download? Well, I got the seven-step plan about how this is going to happen. No. He was afraid. The Egyptians were coming after him. The Egyptians thought it was their God that was opening up the, you know, the waters, but it was our God. But he, all the people were coming after Moses, complaining. I know none of us complain, but Moses was experienced complaining, and people wanted to take him out. Who? So we have to remove the unbelief. Let's pause here for a moment and repent because we all have it. I said, Lord, get every area, every root system out of my heart where I have not believed you, where I get so scared and, and I pull back, but God, forgive me. I want to be that person that you called me to be. So listen, he removed the, the unbelief from his true identity. God is doing that to us in our, in our season. We've been in a place of wilderness where, you know, where God's resetting us and he's saying, look, you can't move forward until I get the root system of unbelief out. We, we, we're going to have to deal with this stuff. And so in Judges 6.13, in the New Living, it says, Sir, Gideon replied, like many of us have said, Well, okay, God, you're calling me a mighty warrior. You're saying how powerful I am and, and that you're for me. But if this is the Lord, and he said, you know, why is all this happened to us? Has anybody ever said that? <laughs> and where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord's abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites? The Lord has not abandoned us. Let me just say that. He knows the end from the beginning. He's got a plan. He's not done with us yet. And so and that's what we have to remember. He is the great I am, and he's got a plan. And so, you know, I said, Lord, you know, how many times have I said that, God? God, what in the world is happening here? Why? Is it only me? You know? And so the Lord, and, and I'm jumping around, Judges 6.16, and it said, he said, the Lord said to him, look, Gideon, warrior, mighty man of God, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. And that's what God's saying to us. Let me tell you something. Regardless of the fear and the worry and whatever you're experiencing, you will win. You will trust me. You will win this battle, and it will turn around. But it takes that tenacity, that, that faith, that, that, that roaring faith, that fervency of, like, I am backing down. I'm not looking to the left nor to the right. Lord, my eyes are going to be fixed upon you, and I'm trusting you. How many of us have experienced great miracles even when we shouldn't have? God broke through. Oh, my gosh. God broke through. Even, even when we were wrong, God broke through. He had mercy on us, but it's that trust and, and pressing into God. So God said to him in the message, 616, in Judges 616, says, I'll be with you, believe me, you will defeat Midian as one man. So if we jump down because of time, in Judges 623 and 24, in the message, God reassured him, said, look, because, you know, Gideon, for those of you, if you're not familiar with the story, Gideon had a couple of fleeces. You know, we all do that. Lord, can you just confirm this word? Can you confirm this? Can you confirm? And, you know, God meets us where we're at. It's okay. I mean, you know, maybe some people may say, well, you should have just trusted. Well, I'm not there yet. You know, I, I like confirmation, right? And so uh, God reassured him. So we jump down and it says here in the message, but God reassured Gideon, said, easy now. Don't panic. You won't die. He must have been from New Jersey. <laughs> then Gideon built an altar there to God and named it God's peace. And it's still called there at, the, at this time if you go to Israel. And then I wrote it down in several other versions. Um, in the name of God uh, Bible, it says, Yahweh said to him, calm down, Gideon. Don't be afraid. You will not die. 
you will not die. So Gideon built an altar there to Yahweh, and he called it Yahweh Shalom. It just cracked me up like some of the different versions and how it was worded. And uh, I felt like I needed to type out the different versions because we need to hear it a couple times. And um, hold on a second. Uh, in Judges 6.23 in the uh, CEV version, it says, Calm down, Gideon. I told you, there's nothing to be afraid of. You're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar for worshiping the Lord and called it, the Lord calms our fears. I love that. <laughs> the Lord calms our fears. So anyway, so he had to build this altar, this altar of peace. Now, what, what, what did I speak about for a couple of years, even before COVID hit, about us building our altar of intimacy? But here, the way it was worded, Gideon had to... He had his, the rocks, you know, if you're going to build an altar, you're going to build it at that time with rocks. So let's take the rocks of our fears, the rocks that the enemy has, has thrown at us, the stones that he threw at us to try to take us down. Let's take those rocks of fear, of anxiety, of worry, of depression, and let's build the altar and let it, the fire of God consume all that that's been hindering us. Amen? Because that, only God knows what he can do and how he can do it. But I was thinking about that. And so he had to build this altar. But the other thing he had to do, it said that, God spoke to him and said, you need to have your, the idols in your family torn down. Wow. His dad, you know, they all worship Baal and Ash, Asherah. I don't know how to say that. And, and so they had, to, they had to destroy this. So, so God commissioned him at home and said, look, you're going to have to deal with the root systems and the strongholds in your own life. And that's what God's saying to us. Listen, I'm, the, I'm your author of peace. I'm not the author of confusion. I want to, to allow you to have a revelation of Jehovah Shalom, but we need to deal with our own stuff, right? I mean, it's so easy to point fingers and, and just say what other people have, but what about our own stuff, right? And so he had to break the strongholds. That he had to tear down the false altars. What, what altars have we erected in our lives? What do we go to? Listen, nothing wrong with sports. You're going to sports for your comfort. You're going to, um, you know, whatever, shopping for your comfort. You're going to, you know, just activities outside rather than running to the Lord. And so he had to tear down the idols and, and represented the Canaanite goddess at the time. And so that was not no easy thing that he did because, listen, he knew that the people would want to kill him. Look at what happened in Acts chapter uh, 16 when, or 19 when uh, Paul and Silas took authority of that spirit of divination. They beat him and threw him in prison because it was their livelihood. See, when, when, when we're taking a stand for Jesus Christ, it's not like, oh, isn't that wonderful? Look at how good they're doing. No, the enemy revolts against that. And we have to also understand in transition, when we're in transition, enemy's always going to try to stop us. Always going to try to discourage us. Always going to try to say, you made a mistake. Right, Lisa? You made a mistake. You know, and, and so that happens to all of us. But you have to know, that's why you have to know, you have to learn to hear the voice of the Lord. Because when you know that you heard God, and God confirms it, you're not going to let go. You're holding on to the horns and the altar. I said, I'm not letting go. I like what Carol was saying, even about worshiping, like in, in times of, you know, when we all get discouraged and she was going through hard times in her church and she said, I, I said out loud, I will worship. I will worship. And she can I will worship. I'm not backing down. See, but we have to take that position. Don't let the enemy tutor you. Don't let him be your voice. Don't let that word be louder than what the word of God is saying. No, I will worship regardless of what you're trying to get me to do. I'm going to speak the word and decree the word regardless of how you're trying to put a mask on me and silence me. I'm going to worship Jesus. That's what we have to do. Lord, I'll be even more undignified. Like David said, I'll worship even louder. Yeah, you can say, yeah, oh, here she goes being a fanatic. That's right, because if you're lukewarm, you're not going to get this. So he had to tear it down. And God gave Gideon peace within his spirit before he won the battle. See, and that's really important. A lot of times we are in peace. How many times is like, I know it's not where I need to be, and I know things haven't shifted, but I have a peace, right? I mean, 
I know, we've all experienced that. That's supernatural. That comes from the Lord. And so peace comes because of him that's inside of us. So the angel spoke to him. He said, tear down the eyes, and he did it. The people wanted to come after him, and, you know, but anyway, he did it. And God, God just protected him. And that's what I want to, you know, I'm not going to go much longer. God wants to uh, encourage all of us. He wants, to, he wants us to know that he's there for us. He's our peace. I want to explain to you what the peace means, what shalom means. When you look up the word, you know, I, I wrote here, let, let God's peace fill our hearts. And, and let's, let our prayers and let our praise sh shape the worries, right? Let, let them, you know, uh, anything that you're filled with this um, frustration and disappointment, you know, speak the word over it. Keep at it. Keep at it. We have to hit it like a battering ram. And I'm telling you right now, I know what's coming. I, this isn't to make anybody afraid because God's got our back, and he has final say over everything. But I don't know that things are going to get better. I don't know that things, I know a lot of prophets have had words about even food shortages. I did have a dream about that a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, so listen, for what it's worth, that's why we have to hear the voice of the Lord. He prepares us. Moses, he, you know, when you read him through it in Hosea, it says that he, Moses was the deliverer. He was a prophet deliverer, Shamgard prophet that, that led the people because he heard the voice of the Lord guiding and giving them wisdom and direction. See, God wants us to have wisdom and direction, not in fear, but it's like God's, God always protects us, and he always gives us wisdom about things. So shalom, what does shalom mean? We're, I, I want you to just give you a little recipe, a little direction, if you're not already doing it. How do you build your altar of peace? And so, you know, we, we pray, we praise, we, we write our decrees, we, we write our prophetic words out, we craft prayers out of them. And so shalom means wholeness, full, lacking nothing. Pay it forward to pay or to render. And so peace is God's payment that says, I don't have to worry about the future because he paid it forward because I know that his word has paid for my provision. See, when you get a revelation of peace, it's not just, oh, I feel good right now. No, it's, it's a warring term that, Lord, I know this God of peace is going to kick the devils behind in plain English. I know this God of peace has got my back. I know this shalom translated in Hebrew, it says that it makes... Uh, makes it good, it shall surely pay. I don't understand how I wrote it. Make full restoration or to restore. It also means an overall sense of fullness and completeness in mind, body, and spirit. It means tranquility. And so God is saying, listen, I got you. I, this, uh, this shalom means uh, a state of well-being and prosperity be upon you. That's what he's saying to us. Amen. He's saying, my peace pays it forward for you. I've got you covered. I went into the future to bring you into the now to protect you. I have this for you. I want you to know you can trust me. I had a dream, and I shared this a while ago, where I was on this roller coaster, and I hate roller coasters, and I was trying to get off, and, and so I, it was me and, and Ann Tate, who was from Gloria Zion, and I knew it represented, she's their main intercessor, and I knew it represented prayer, and I was in my dream, I kept saying, and I knew the conductor was God, and I kept saying, I got to get off. <laughs> I'm not staying on this thing. And I kept saying, I have to go to the bathroom. I have to get off. I was making all these excuses. And he said, you need to sit down. You need to hold on tight and you need to trust me. Wow. And that's what God is saying to us. Sit down, hold on tight and trust me. We have to trust in him with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding and all our ways acknowledge him and he'll direct our path. So we have to hold on tight. And so Gideon was afraid. Gideon was a man like us. He's like, oh, my God, I have all these challenges. I have these armies that have come against me. Now my family, you know, I'm tearing down these idols. Now they're all ticked off with me. How many, when you got saved, your family had a fit? You know, it was okay if you got high, but then you're, now you're serving Jesus and everyone's mad at you. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so, but then what happened was his father started to stick up for him. And now God gives him, we're in chapter 7, God gives him a strategy, and he says, listen, he said, I want you to go destroy the Midianites. And he's like, are you kidding me? They were my fiercest enemy, and you want me to destroy them? He goes, yeah, I want you to go. And at first he had a gazillion guys, I don't remember the exact number, 
Um, but what, they had a lot. And he said, there's too many. And he said, so in, in Judges chapter, chapter 7, verses 2 through 3, he said, there are too many people with me for you for me to hand over Midian to you. Otherwise, Israel will boast about themselves hmm, against me, saying, my own power has rescued me. So now proclaim in the hearing of the people, whoever is afraid and trembling, let him turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men returned home, but 10,000 remained. Listen, fear neutralizes the power of God and causes us to focus on ourselves and our weakness. Say Selah. And so that's the thing. Are you focusing just on you or are you really asking the Lord, we're going to have to do things afraid. We're going to have to step out and do it afraid. And so Judges 7, 4 says there were still too many. And he said, These, the guys that are lapping the water like a dog, he said, he said they're, they're too distracted. I don't want them with me. He said, too many. There's still too many. He says, I don't want them... Um, to be a distraction to this war that we're in because God's calling people that are alert watchmen. And, and so the other 300 were, uh, I read in um, Brian Simmons said, which I thought was interesting, he said the ones that were cupping the water represented the fivefold ministry. He said that, that were disciplined and that were focused. And, I, I mean, that was just a side note that uh, Brian Simmons wrote, which I kind of like. And so he said, I will, I will give them, I will give you victory. And so, in other words, my whole point in saying all this, it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> so you're telling me I had, 30, let's say, 32,000 men that were, we were going to fight the enemy of the Amalekites, the Amorites, you know, the Midianites, and you're telling me to get rid of these people. He's saying, yeah, because if they don't have a right heart attitude, with me, if they're not aligned, it's going to create a problem. It's not that I don't love them, but I need people that have a, a single eye laser beam focus on me. That you're not going to straddle the fence. You're not going to look to the left or to the right. You're going to have a trust in me and know that I've got you and that I love you and that I'm going to guide you and I'm going to direct you. So with that being said, we have to be like the, the men that, that were the Gideon 300 army that God said that we all are, and not just us, I mean the church at large of those that are truly looking to, to follow God in like the deer panteth after the water brooks, right? And it's not perfection, okay? It's not that you're perfect and you never make a mistake. The word really means maturity. It means that you're mature in him and that no matter what, I'm not backing down. No matter what, you know, I'm not turning back. You know, I, I, I choose to trust Jesus. I'm, I'm going with him all the way because had it not been for Jesus on our side, where would we be? I don't know that I'd be alive. I don't know. But it's that fervency, the zeal of the Lord has consumed me. It's that passion for Jesus. If, there's, if you don't have that passion stirred up, we're going to pray for Jesus. Because I'll tell you, to me, the worst place to be is in that in-between state. Amen. You're not hot. You're not cold. It's, it's a stinky place to be. But God wants us to be in that place of passion. And so the Gideon army, what they did, they, they went into the valley there. They heard a dream that God said, listen, I'm going to work it out for you. We cannot figure it out. Who would have thought that Gideon would have, the guys would have had a dream and interpret the dream and say, hey, Gideon's going to destroy us. And Gideon's like, oh, we got the word of the Lord. They already know where they're going to get beat. So you see what I'm saying? God can do anything. God can work miracles. God can, he, you know, we, he, we have to break the limitations that we have placed upon him because he's saying, listen, I am your prince of peace. I am not the author of confusion. Wherever there's confusion in the midst, the Bible says Satan is there. He's not the author of fear. He's saying, listen, rise up. Doesn't mean you're not real with what you're feeling. Hear what I'm saying? Doesn't mean you play the game and act all religious like, oh, no, I'm just trusting God. Meanwhile, your knees are knocking. No, you, you, it's okay to say, speak the truth. It's okay to express where you're at, but, not, but say, I don't care what I'm feeling. I'm going to worship no matter what. I'm going to praise him no matter what. I'm not backing down. I'm not going to just stay home and sulk. That's just what the enemy wants. And he will devour you. That's what he wants. And so, um, you know, I'm just encouraged by this because, I, I mean, I have a gazillion scriptures here. 
God is the Prince of Peace, but I see the time. Listen to this one. Jeremiah 29, 11, in the Names of God Bible, it says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares Yahweh. They're plans for peace and not disaster. Plans that give you a future filled with hope. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. He says, don't fret or have any anxiety about anything. Every time I go in that place of anxiety, I, I always go to this group. like, that's right, Lord. I give you this anxiety. I give you this fear. You know, when you're in that place, when you're building your altar of peace, Lord, everything I'm feeling that's contrary to your word, I give it to you. I surrender it to you. I'm not going to meditate on that. What you meditate on, you empower. All right? So it says, don't fret about anything. But in every circumstance and in everything by prayer and petition, definite requests with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. He's not upset with you. It says, and God's peace shall be your tranquil state of soul, assured of its salvation through Christ. So fearing nothing from God, and here's the key, being content with its earthly lot of whatever sort that is, or another version says, being content in whatever state we're in learning how to. I'm not going to get all flipped out over what's happening. I'm trusting Jesus. But I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to take a stand about things. I'm not going to, I'm not giving in to a lot of what they're, listen, and, and I'll say it again. You know, people say that in the church, you don't have a right to speak about what's happening in the government. Well, I, I beg to differ. Because John the Baptist spoke to Herod. All the prophets, they spoke to the kings. They gave them direction. This critical race theory. And, um, you know, what's the other one that they had? The, uh, the woke thing. The woke, the, the woke thing. It's not godly. It's antichrist. It's against the word of God, period. And, and the thing is, it's like, wait a second. God loves all the people that's putting that together. So let, let's show them the power of God in us and the love that he has for everybody. But you're going to cancel people out because you don't agree? Are you kidding me? But that's, that's the plan of the enemy, and he wants us to get into this global movement, this global mindset nonsense. I'm telling you, we have to know what the Word says. We have to be Bereans. We have to read the Word. And then I'll end with this. It says in, in Isaiah 60, wait, no, Isaiah 48, 18 says, if only you had listened to my companions, commands, your peace would be like a river that never runs dry. Your righteousness would be like waves on the sea. Lord, I want to obey everything you have for me. And then I'll close with this. Isaiah 66, 12, for thus says the Lord, behold, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of nations like an overflowing stream. Then you will be nursed and you will be carried on her hip and trotted lovingly, bounced up and down on her and God's maternal knees. See, he wants to extend his peace to us like a river. And it's us doing what God is asking us to do. God is saying, just obey me. God is saying, if you don't have passion, ask him for that passion. Ask for the zeal of the Lord. Ask, and I don't mean being a, a, a mean, self-righteous Christian. That's not what I'm talking about. It's, it's honor and respect and love. Always remember that. Jesus never um, trashed people. He, he didn't condemn, like he spoke truth. And he didn't go running after the people either, by the way. He spoke truth because he loved them. And when you love someone, you speak the truth. You're not going to just go along with what they're, what they're doing. In sin, you say, but I don't want to offend them. Yeah, but I don't want them going to hell either. You know, I'm going to speak the truth in love. So I just want to encourage you with this word that he is our prince of peace. He knows where we're, he knows every situation. If we're struggling with fear, if we're struggling with anxiety, he's there for you. He loves us. And he wants us to know that wherever we're at, give it over to him. I used to battle so much with fear and anxiety, depression. I had it almost all. And, and so I know how hard it is when you're, you're going through that. So I'm not suggesting, well, just get over and quote a scripture. It's not what I'm saying. But what I had to do is just, I, I just cried out to God. They cried out to God. It was a place of desperation. I said, I can't live this way any longer, God. I don't want to. I don't know how to do it. They're telling me these scriptures help. How is that going to help? I mean, you know how you, you think these things through? How the heck is the scripture going to help me? Well, it does. <laughs> I mean, I was trying to intellectualize. I was trying to understand it. You're not. I just said, God, help me. I don't know how to get out of this mess, but you do. So I started to really meditate on the word and worship. 
And, and the worship came eventually. It didn't, what didn't happen right away. But I start meditating on the word. And then God just started unlocking me. Then I went through deliverance. You know, we're, we, we do deliverance here. Christians can have demons, by the way. So I needed freedom from, from the past. I needed freedom. And God provides these tools for us. And it's only the enemy that says that you can't speak in tongues. You can't go through deliverance. You can't because he knows it'll keep you locked up in that land of captivity, in that land of bondage. He's saying, listen, I want to be your peace. I want to help you here. So I'd like you to stand. And I just want you to be encouraged, as I keep saying, that he's got your back. He loves you. And that we're here to pray for you. We're here for you. And, and you're not alone in this. You know, I love the scripture where it says that God would never leave us nor forsake us. He doesn't abandon us. It's not like, well, that's your problem. How many times are you going to hear this word? That's not God. But God doesn't want us to go along with things that are anti-Christ. He doesn't want us to go along with or align with things that are against him. So we have to check our hearts, okay? So, Lord, I just thank you for each and every person here. I thank you that you are our shalom. You know, we sing that song from Numbers, chapter 6, you know, he, that he wants his peace. He wants his face to shine upon us. Lord, I thank you that you're our shalom. And if you're battling with any kind of fear or anxiety, or if you want the passion, I'm going to pray for passion to be stirred up, but it's a choice, right? We have to do things too. We have to activate it. I want you to come forward. We have prayer. Uh, we have a prayer team to pray. But if you're struggling with that, because that will hinder your freedom that will hinder your peace uh, I'd like you to make your way forward don't feel embarrassed you know we've I've had my set of issues here and and so I have to be careful I, I have to watch what I'm watching I have to watch what I'm listening to because I know what gets to me right so if you're battling with then come forward just come forward and we're happy to pray